Welcome to what will be episode 214 on the CX-CC YouTube channel, uh, finding and validating problems, or as I like to say, is it really a problem? And before we jump in with our super special uh, recurring guest of fantasticness, Tom, we're going to, of course, thank our paid Patreon members. Um, thanks to everybody who's supporting our channel and our content uh, in whatever way you support it. Uh, we also thank the free Patreon members who are not paying at all. Uh, there's, uh, We think we have almost 200 members now, and I think a third are paying. So obviously, financial support is great. And if you can't, just join it for free and be among the first to know things and get things. Um, so that having been said, and of course, reminders, or I'm pointing in the right place to check our events calendar and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Let's introduce Tom. Tom, who the heck are you? Hello. Uh, so I am a fellow designer and researcher of some years. I won't say exactly how many. Um, I'm also, I've, I've not really prepared this very well. I'm the author of this little box of things, a deck of cards called Innovation Tactics, which are lots and lots of little methods collected from my career, which are all about ditch the guesswork and make things people want, um, which I think is, yeah, I, we, we quite like that. So it, it's a, it, there's definitely, there's some research methods in there. There's some other stuff. There's some stuff for influence. And uh, what we're gonna have today in today's session is uh, some of those. So I'm actually gonna share some of the cards and you can take them away with you using the, the Miro board that we're working with today. Yes, I have it on my clipboard. I'm ready to paste that uh, when you uh, when you say so, sir. Fabulous. Uh, yeah. So today we are talking a bit about what, what is a real problem? How do we find and validate problems? And we're going to get into a bunch of stuff. I've got some thoughts that are a bit spicy. I've spent 20 years worrying about this. And so I've gone down some strange philosophical holes. And so I'm going to do some challenging of what we think about problems and solutions. But I'm also going to give you lots of practical methods that I have found work to actually help to unpick this rather thorny little mess that we can sometimes find ourselves in. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is if everyone's game, let's jump into the Miro and I will drag you all to me. Okay, let me put that link in the chat. Oh. And I'm going to be asking you a question. Hold on, Did I have you... to go get a better version of the link because LinkedIn slapped its uh, weird redirect. Uh, John it. Okay. Yeah, give me one moment to do a better copy paste. And uh, and Tom, if you're going to keep this up, uh, we'll also put it in the YouTube description so other people can check it out later. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. And I, I'll definitely keep this up, and it will be open so it's it's there to have a look at Great, so you. i see people's cursors whizzing around i'm going to drag you all to me yes uh, and i can't share my screen maybe you can you, can. you should be able to it said an error occurred and it didn't like it that's not nice at all okay so let me share mine give me a moment oh no, uh, now it says it's sharing uh, okay it great then slick so slick uh right so no, it's an error occurred. So yeah, if you could share. Um, yes, I can. Please give me a moment. Uh, let me just separate it on a different plane of existence uh, so people don't see the other wacky things in my world. And um, let's folks see. who are here, just see if you can answer this. Uh, so there's some green stickies and some pink stickies. And we're wondering, well, just tell us about a time when you worked on a real problem. We're just like, yes, that is a real problem. That is fantastic. And then a pink sticky and tell us about a time when there wasn't a real problem. It's like, ah, it's not a real problem. Oh, I got a good one. Oh, God. I hooked so many pink stickies. Somebody stop me. <laughs> so we'll just spend, I'll use my Miro powers. Let's just do two minutes, see if we can get down a, okay. a couple of ideas. And thank you, everyone, for, for indulging this.
I love it. So someone just they start with a green one and then to me, the side. I oh, realized good. I was on the wrong one. And I'm not <laughs> colorblind. It was probably me too. <laughs> I, I have so many, it's hard to know even where to start. I know I love that. I love that. my head all the uh all the oh gosh. I'm sorry for triggering this level of trauma. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see, a real problem. <laughs> um, this is where it's harder, huh? <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Yeah, like what do you how do you define real? What is is it just real, whatever we think is a real problem at this point? Yeah. It, it, that, that's it, what we're at. So what do we what do we mean by a real problem? What do you mean by a real problem? I'm sort of interested. Fair enough. Um, ooh, there we go. So let's have a, a little quick read through while we're there. Uh I will again summon so it all zooms into me, which it should do. There we go. Um Oh, nice. Worked on a travel system that assists travel agencies in optimizing their daily operations. Interesting. A better tool to help students pan, plan their course path at our uni. People but aren't buying enough of our stuff. And they weren't. Yeah, these are interesting. Oh, improving onboarding for our overcomplicated product. Uh, product managers, project managers need another system to manage their boards with AI. OK, real problems. Good. And what were not real problems? We think mobile users aren't filtering search results enough. We think people aren't motivated enough to improve their finances, um, as if the problem was motivation. <laughs> Evidently, they thought the problem was motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, but people aren't clicking this button enough. Exec said so. Oh, and the, the project managers need another system has moved over. Yes, uh, yeah, <laughs> that was intriguing. Nice, OK. Oh, people aren't interacting with our product enough. Mm. Mm, that engagement. One. Oh, that, that, that's <laughs> triggering me now. Yes. What if they don't want to? <laughs> but, but Tom, execs said engagement. Yes, Melanie's crying. Yes. <laughs> yeah, cool. So that's nice. Thank you for indulging that. I, I did want to have a little look at this because I know that, uh, let me try to bring everyone again. We'll go, boosh. So we came for this. How do we know what a real problem is? How do we know which problems to solve? And how do we learn what these are or verify or validate them? Um, something that I noticed from the way all of those stories are written above, the green ones tended to be mainly about someone outside the company's life. And the pink ones tended to be mainly about someone inside the company's life. Mm. And that was an interesting sort of uh, thing that I noticed. And I don't know if I saw that. Uh, so what you're going to get today, I'm going to give a bit of a challenge for you to think through well, what is a problem and why Why do we care? And a, a little challenge, say, well, what if us insisting on the correct design approach is actually itself a solution looking for a problem? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to invite you to shift your stance, but bring your nerd energy. And I'm going to give you at least 12 methods. I might have put more on there. Wow. So. All for the low, low price of... Sorry. <laughs> the low, low price now of, of zero. Yes, yes. Very fair. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, there's a lot of stuff on here. I'm aware that is like there, there's writing here. And so what I'm going to give you now is a quick sort of intro, but I'm going to leave the board up so you can come and explore this at your leisure. Because I will say, going back in time, I was... Uh, what well, I'm doing the terrible thing now if I'm, I'm going to move off the screen where there's writing because I'm doing the thing of there's writing on the screen you're going to read that instead of listening to me so instead I'm going to talk for a moment I'm going to say I was a researcher I was a designer and I knew that there was a right way to do things right we know this you have to go you define the problem and then when you understand the problem then you figure out the solutions and then you win and that's great isn't it yeah and that's how it worked. And then I started to find times when that, it didn't quite ring true. It didn't feel like that was working. And I saw lots of situations where we did it that way and it just didn't actually work very well. 
And there were times when we did it in, or other people had done it in other ways, and it actually worked fine. And maybe I wasn't right all the time. And one thought that popped up, if we can go back to the, the lovely board of oh, a thousand uh, lines of text. Trying to give you your, your focus. Oh, Everybody. thank you. Lovely, lovely. So um, there's a really lovely uh, essay by Nora Bateson, which is a, a lot of copies of it are paywalled, but I found one that isn't through Wiley. Uh, and it's a really lovely essay to read, which is about uh, readying and how does a system uh, like a, an organism or an ecosystem ready for change, which may mean you can't see really anything happening for a while. And then suddenly something starts happening and it, but it's not necessarily directive or, or goal driven necessarily. It's something that, that can sometimes emerge. And one of the thoughts in this is from Nora Bateson's father, Gregory Bateson, who talked about um, abductive processes as being descriptions of one another. And the examples that I really like is uh, the moss is a description of the tree as the tree is the description of the moss. The bacteria in the soil and the fungus in the soil are describing the forest. And so everything is interconnected in this way. And I started to see solutions and problems as that as well. The solutions and the problems are naturally completely intertwined. And so there's a degree to which you can't define a problem by itself. It, it doesn't exist on its own, sitting around in the forest waiting to be picked. It is something that is in communication with potential solutions, with the adjacent possible that we have. In uh, context. In context, exactly. Um, so that that's one thing that I want to just poke into your head. The other is, I mean, I wonder how many of these systems lamentations us designers have shared about people we've worked with. I have certainly said, all of these in the past. And I think if you scroll through LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever, whatever your preferred troll slash flame war tool of choice is, you will see loads of posts about these. <laughs> exactly. Uh, just just misery. And this uh, I'm going to point you out it's it's an article which was on a paid newsletter and now is in a book that i can't uh, like just share with you all for free i'm afraid uh, but it's by a guy called venkatesh rao and i will confess this was something where i actually wrote to him a little story about my woes and he wrote an article that was basically to me but anonymized and it absolutely floored me um and it, i was saying these things like i was saying these things look the problem is design. Why are they missing this root cause? Why are they not doing the things that are obvious to me that are, are clearly the thing that is you know, wrong? And one of the points he makes is, is this. If you are the one who thinks everyone else is missing the thing, you're the one who's missing something by being trapped in a functionally fixed perspective. Uh, and so I don't want to go too far. Like when we're holding the design hammer, and we're looking for nails, we need nails to be everywhere in order for us to be valuable in the system. And so we tend to see nails when maybe there are other things. And anyway, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of that. Let's see where you go with this. Let's see where I go with this. So <laughs> the big thing here is just because we are right that there is a design problem or a research problem or people aren't seeing things the way that we're seeing them, we could be absolutely right in our perspective, but that doesn't make everyone else wrong in their perspectives. When you've got a, a complex system, there are many ways of looking at it, and all of them are partial, none are strictly superior. And so everybody believes that the system is broken in some fundamental way, and they have an opinion on the root cause. There are no root causes in complex systems. It's all dispositional, it's all messy, it's all fun. And what this all comes down to, if I just zoom through it quickly, so we've got time for the other stuff, is, uh, you know, the parable of the blind men touching the elephant. We're all blind men touching the elephant. And the designers, shall we say, tend to be holding onto the tail of the elephant and saying, look, it's a rope problem. We've got a rope problem and we're brilliant at solving rope problems. Come on, 
come and look at me i've got i've got the rope but we are working with people who are not holding the rope or the elephant's tail they are holding the elephant's leg and they're saying well that's lovely that you've got a rope problem but i've got a tree trunk problem when i've got a rope problem absolutely we'll do it your way but right now we've got a tree trunk problem and the reality is we're all wrong and we're all right and it doesn't matter what matters is the hippo the person with the power they're the one who will define which systems lament gets validated which perspective mm -hmm. on what the problem is is valid in the system depends on their perspective and so arguing oh we've, we've zoomed uh, i think i've lost the uh, the draggy power arguing rarely works i've tried that i've argued with lots and lots of people and i don't think i really changed anyone's minds ever or did anything apart from reducing my organizational capital uh, and and causing myself uh, pain i've also tried bringing evidence and when some evidence didn't work i brought more evidence and i brought facts and i brought more evidence and that didn't really work either it, it, it just didn't really work all of those and i realized later and thanks to Venkatesh Rao, they were, I was trying to validate my own point of view. I was trying to validate that I was right in the way that I was saying things. And so what I started to do was to instead come round to where the people that I'm working with were standing and stand with them and look at the world through their perspective and go, oh, yeah, I see. The world does suck in the way that you think it sucks. Absolutely. My God, that's terrible, isn't it? You're absolutely right. And hey, let's jam on this thing. Let's jam together and, and bring my design and research skills to the fore, but without labeling them that, without like hitting them over the head with me, must do research process, just bringing the research process as part of the fun, making it a, an enjoyable process that wasn't uh, arguing, wasn't trying to persuade them of my point of view. And I don't mean don't challenge them. I never mean, no, just go with them, do it their way, do what they tell you. Challenge them, but also let go of the assumption that you are de facto right and that your way of seeing the world is right. So with that, that's something to sort of think about and float around. Now I want to whistle through. If you have questions or comments or you want me to go away now, you can just uh, leave some messages in the chat. That's, that's all awesome. Um, Questions is moderate. Yeah, Debbie's moderating. Fantastic. I'm now going to share a few methods directly from Innovation Tactics, which we'll is at the start. And if you would like to think about getting a copy, uh, that would be would be amazing. I'm just going to bring everyone to me again. Does that work? The presentation is not updating. Now it's updating. There we are. Innovation Tactics. I've got to say, I'm quite proud of it. I spent a lot of time working on this uh, and then brilliant people did amazing illustrations and it's designed nicely. Um, so I'm really happy with it. And I'm going to share some actual methods from the deck with you right now, which relate to the questions that we came here to answer. And again, we'll do a bit of, of a whistle stop tour because there's a lot, uh, a lot that we could talk about. And there is no one right way. I can't give you the here's the simple way forward. Just do this and everything will be fine. Instead, we're going to have lots of things to try and you'll figure out what works best for you in the context that you're in. Remix these, change them to fit your purposes. And that's where we're going to go. Sound good? Let's go. So first, let's start with the real pain. A few things to try when you feel you're being given a solution in search of a problem, which I think is one of the one of the biggest complaints i hear from designers i'm just going to update that or oh, the screen going slowly is is making me antsy but these are a few things to try when you feel you're being given a solution in search of a problem and you're like what am i supposed to do and the first one solution aikido i was sitting in a I remember this vividly sitting at a conference it was a, some sort of adobe thing and there were people doing really good talks and one of the designers in the audience put their hand up and said, how can I get my colleagues to stop bringing me their solutions and start coming to me with the problems? And my heart went out to him. I thought, yeah, I've been there. I know how you feel. 
the speaker was really helpful and gentle and guided him through what really struck me in that moment was this colleague himself had a solution in mind the solution that he wanted to have in to have happen was that his colleagues brought him problems instead of solutions but the problem was it wasn't a solution he was capable of having there was no way to make this solution happen and he'd stopped looking at what the real problem was uh, and so solution aikido grew out of this and it's a way of uh, the way that I found you work with the solutionizing energy. You don't fight people when they bring you solutions. They're trying to tell you something, the solution. Remember, the solution is a reflection of the problem that the person sees but cannot express the same way that the moss is a reflection of the tree. Uh, and you can therefore understand a lot about the problems that people are suffering by examining and digging into the solutions that they're presenting to you. The solutions aren't coming, they're not pulling them out. Well, they, they might be pulling them out of their backside, but they're pulling out of their backside for a reason. Like it's because this solution feels like it's gonna do something beneficial for them in solving a problem or getting a result. And so uh, Solution Aikido is one way to start gently using that energy to mine or sort of be a detective about well, what might be the problem that you're really trying to solve. So that's the first one. Uh, a next one, which is sitting right there, Time Machine, that is uh, my twist on the pre-mortem by Gary Klein. And if you haven't read Gary Klein's stuff, he's absolutely brilliant on um, all sorts of ways. How do we get to insights? How do we uh, understand the world and things like that? Very, very worth reading. He, uh, yeah, he, he came up with the pre-mortem originally. The time machine is, is my version where we go to two worlds, but one of the most important parts of the time machine framing is it all comes when somebody comes with, this is what we're gonna build, this is the plan, this is the feature that we are gonna build and that's what we're gonna do next. And so we jump in a time machine and say, great, now it's two months after we've built the feature and it's brilliant, it's gone amazingly well, what's happened? And you get the stakeholder and all of the engineers and the designer and the product manager and everyone who's involved to do this exercise together. And you find out well, what are the secret hopes that people aren't really saying out loud when they're busy talking about what the feature is and, and, and how wonderful it is. And what you usually find is everyone's got quite different hopes and we haven't really talked about this and it's it, people are expecting you to do some magical things and some reasonable things. Then we get back in the time machine and it's still a couple of months after the thing has launched, but something goes wrong and we end up in a parallel universe where this feature went so badly wrong that we wish we'd never even started it. And that's the important framing. We've got to wish we never even started it. It's not a launch failure. It's not something in when we shipped it, something went wrong. No, no, it, it is just terrible from the, the outset. And then we get everyone to do the same thing. Well, what went wrong? Why is this so bad? What does this world look like? And by doing that, we start to uncover the hidden fears that people might have. And we also start to see that other people have different fears from we from the fears that we have and you start to open a different conversation and so this has been i'd say this is one of the most generative things for getting people to be interested in in other sorts of uh, in in opening the door for research and experimentation this is my favorite bit is when you see it uh, you can see it in some stakeholders eyes that this is the first time they've even ever allowed themselves to consciously consider that the thing might fail and it it can open the door like all of these methods i will say it is not infallible there are plenty of times when people will have that look and then they'll bury it and they'll plow on regardless but at least you know now what you're dealing with there are other times when all of the team are really worried well this could be harmful for users or this might not work, people might not want it. And what the stakeholder re reveals is, yeah, that might happen, but our hands are tied. We've promised this to a partner, so we've got to do it anyway. And now you can move forward knowing what you're really dealing with. It's, it, it, it takes away some of, the, uh, some of the mess that you can find yourself in. So that's one. Do we want some more? Um, I was going to say, we've got a few more minutes. We've been trying to keep these around a half hour, um, but we do have a, queue, uh, a question, so let's ask that. Yep. What do you do if participants refuse to imagine a scenario where things could go terribly wrong? 
Do you know what? I have, I've never had a scenario where all the participants have refused that. So I've done mm. hundreds of these now. I've never had that particular fear really happen. Now, I have worked with a series of founders and there was one who really, really struggled to imagine that world. And really, really, it made him very uncomfortable. He wasn't happy about being in that world even for two minutes. Um, what do you do in that case? Well, what I realized, and it took me too long, was realizing he's going to do what he's going to do. There is nothing that we can do to persuade him. He's going to have to actually go through it and actually have it fail in real life for him to be able to come to terms with this because he's he's just not ready actually i think is what i found yeah so we see this helps. in regular life too yeah. like you know we have to remember that the people we can't convince to quit smoking then show up to jobs and they can't be convinced of risk or problems sometimes you can't even convince them of the problem that's already happening like it's actually yep. happening and they're still like no so you i'm know, fine i'm happening. fine yeah Yes, and, exactly. So until uh, they have a, a shocking like wake up call, potentially some sort of massive health scare. But even then, some people go back and continue smoking. It's yeah, we have to. We, we're all human at the end of the day. And we have our particular foibles and the things that we can't let go of. And other people are like that, too. <laughs> That's OK. Yeah, it's um, a good question, though. It's but it's uh, it's something we can't always control or fix and that's why i tell everybody put your put your own oxygen mask on first yes take care of yourself take care of yourself i love it and yeah. it is hard in that we've talked about this before debbie i know on another show in this particular environment and this particular context of the world um I'm seeing questions popping up. Yeah, it's I'll, very I'll exciting. Go Finish your thought and I'll read it. Particular, that. particular uh, careers context, it can be a little bit difficult for us to just say, oh, let's get a new job then. That might not be a choice. Sometimes put your own oxygen mask on means you just have to kind of keep your head down and make sure that you're not rocking the boat too much at this point. Um, so everything here, I would say, is to be used with some caution. It, they're not all completely safe, but nothing nothing that's going to get you to make progress is going to be completely safe. Good point. Yeah. So let me read out Karen's question. Um, please, could you provide one or two examples of what constitutes a real problem? For example, Uber and Airbnb are both addressing real problems. What's the secret to determining if a problem is real and if a business can be built around it? Uh -huh. Cool. So... I will zoom out a little bit. Um, the secret is, I think, if we zoom down to the bottom set of cards. So I've got a thing here, which is how do we verify or validate problems with a little note? Beware of seeking validation. The secret to knowing that you found a real problem is that when you solve it, you have a business. Like ultimately, that's the only way you're really going to know with absolute certainty is after you've already been solved it and it's working really well for quite a long time. Um, everything else is uncertain to some degree, but there are some tools you can use to help give you more confidence. It's not just lol, throw darts at the wall and hope that something sticks. You can increase your confidence gradually. Where I get I think most beefy with the validation is the idea that you can validate something and then you're done. Tick. We now know that. And that's not how anything works. Let's go build it. <laughs> exactly. Um, so some tools, uh, I would say, I'm going to zoom in on something called solve for distribution. Uh, I'm going to drag you to me if I can. So this, I'd say, in terms of like what's a real problem, this is when you get into the idea of, well, this product market fit is what you're looking for. You will get product market fit if you are solving a real problem that people have that they are willing to pay time, money, energy in order to have you solve. They're not, uh, you know, they're, they're not paying you for fun. They're paying you because you're solving their problem. And my, I, I sort of made this card originally as a bit of a, a fun exercise but i realized later this actually is probably my definition of, of when you have product market fit 
you have a repeatable story of the product story and the distribution story that I've laid out on the back of this card. So you are able to describe a specific person with a specific struggle. You know how they've tried to make progress with it. They are already trying. That's one thing that makes it a real problem. It's not something they just complain about. They are actually trying to do something about it. But what they're doing at the moment isn't enough. They're still not satisfied. And you have a way that's much, much better. And you know how your idea fits into their life and the simple things they need to do in order to make their life better. And so that's your product story. But that's not enough by itself because there are tons of products out there that are brilliant products, well designed, well engineered, that would completely solve someone's problem and have never made a penny and are not. You just don't know about them because they haven't solved the distribution story. And for the distribution story, you need to now understand much more about your potential customer's world. You need to know in which moments they become aware of this struggle that they're trying to deal with, the need that they have, uh, where they've been looking, where they're looking, where they are right now, and where they're looking to help them make progress. Therefore, how they come across your idea and why they're going to choose your idea specifically over the many alternatives that they actually have available, including the killer of all businesses. Maybe I'll do it later. Maybe I'll stop smoking tomorrow, that sort of thing. And then you also need to understand how they're going to justify their choice to others. Because the reason that they tell you they bought your product isn't really why they bought it. It's just the reason that they give to help them feel good and to help explain why they did it to other people. So my take is if you can tell these stories with confidence and with a lot of examples of people who fit this pattern, then you've got product market fit and you can grow that thing. Before you've got product market fit, if you can't tell these stories at all, even hypothetically, you probably don't have a real problem or you probably don't have a real problem. It might be a real problem, but not one that you are believably capable of solving as an individual or a company. And so you've got those two aspects to it. And I think often people completely overlook the distribution side of it. It's not enough just to have a problem. Yep. That's okay. So I've made of course, some yeah, I feel like talking. I'm talking a lot. No, you're great. You're today's guest. You should be talking a lot. So um uh two things that I wrote down are like, look, we all know if you've read uh Derek Siver Siver's book, you know anyone can have an idea, anyone can have a solution, anyone can imagine or know there's a problem out there and have an idea. But that book says the the real gold or platinum or or diamonds are in the execution. Because when we think, you know, we all talk about Airbnb all day long, but do we talk about VRBO? Do we talk about home away? You know, these are competitors to Airbnb who hypothetically could be mentioned in the same sentence and yet we're, we don't mention them. So there's something Airbnb did that was different, better, hopefully ethical, whatever it is. Um, where they've become this shining star as a problem solver. But in reality, we must remember that if we roll ourselves back, say, 10 years, and if someone said to you, hey, I'm going to start this website and it's going to let people rent a room to people in their house. They're going to have strangers coming in and out of their house all the time. You're going to have to keep cleaning your apartment and uh, people are just going to rent your, your house or your apartment for a couple of days or longer and, and, you know, hope, I hope they don't break your stuff and yeah. set it on fire. I think people would have said like, this is never going to happen. There's no way. And no one's renter's insurance is going to cover this. It, it was a real possibility that, that this was a, a, a solution that didn't take off. And I think people that's where the exactly execution that. is. Yeah. yeah. I, I was there. Yeah. People said exactly that. It's, well, it started Remember, out as... You're going to get into a car with a stranger in their car. Maybe they removed the locks and you can't yeah. get out. You know. They're unlicensed. They haven't done the training. Yeah. You're they crazy. Yeah. Airbnb started. You're going to stay on someone's... You're going to have strangers come and stay on your couch. Like, that's where it started. It wasn't even pretending your home is a hotel. It was just have strangers come to your house. That'll be fun. And people thought it was crazy. What they did and what what Uber did, and I think Uber, we can be questioned about whether they are solving a real problem, whether it is a real solution. Airbnb has lots of knock on effects that are oh, unintended nice. consequences we may not want. Um, however, what they did was they did it for one person first. They just tried it like the, the founders of Airbnb put an ad in Craigslist and had people stay on their couch. 
and they then scaled it up from there. So there's this idea, uh, like someone, Reid Hoffman said, start with things that don't scale. And I saw someone reframe it the other day. Don't th start with things that scale. When they started that, all they needed to know is, can we get one person to, to think, oh, I need somewhere to stay. How do I find somewhere to stay? Why do I choose this? Well, it's oh, it's cheaper than the hotel, and it sounds quite fun to stay on someone's. And then it actually happened, and it really worked, and they did it, and then they grew a business out of it. So, which and links back nicely around. Happened. It could have also not happened, and then we wouldn't know about Airbnb. Right. Yeah. I think um, if they had had some big public controversies at the start, it could have changed that trajectory. Like if there had been fires and murders and um it thefts and and other negative words we don't want to say out loud then maybe it would have been too tainted and and people wouldn't have adopted it as much completely and so yeah i mean in all of this let's not underestimate the role of of luck and being in the right place at the right time and happening to have the right to i can tell you a little secret about airbnb how did they get the distribution really growing it's semi unethical, but what they did was they had a, a bot that automatically posted all of their listings into Craigslist through a backdoor. And then they got a sudden influx of traffic and that kickstarted their growth. They tried a lot of experiments, but you, you want to watch out because a lot of these big companies have done stuff that you wouldn't necessarily think was a good thing to do. Craigslist yeah so interesting yeah I, obviously you're you're a great guest to have on and you've been uh, on our channel a number of times i know we'll have you back again we should probably wind up since we're trying to keep some of these a little bit shorter um but karen asks can we reach out to you on linkedin can we ask a few questions especially after we've seen your cards absolutely you totally can yeah i'd be really happy for that uh anytime yeah so reach out on linkedin i'll also let you know that um through the Pitdex world, we do uh, all of the authors do occasional uh, like open Q and A type sessions. So if you're curious about the cards, about any of these methods, you want to know more, then uh, that is open for everyone to join. Excellent, excellent. Well, Tom, it was great to have you back. For people listening, he was T O M. K-E-R-W-I-N. You can find him on LinkedIn, man with beard. and uh, <laughs> Yet another man with a beard. Yes. <laughs> he looks like his picture, but if people, some people say, I'm not watching your stuff. I listen when I'm walking my dog. So if you find him on LinkedIn later, yes, man in England with mustache and beard. And um, we hope to see you again. And I guess I'll have to uh, stop recording. But Tom, any last thing you want to mention to everybody? Last thing I want to mention is just thank you very much for having me on, Debbie. And yeah, also really interested in how people got on with my philosophy section about problems. <laughs> yes, for the short version, it was great. So uh, thank you again and uh, hope to see everybody soon in another of our free events. Join us soon. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. It was fantastic.